Another turn of the wheel, the Garden of Childhood. In those times, it took almost a day to travel from Santiago to the family estate in the foothills of the Andes. On alighting from an ancient train, one was driven through the tiny provincial town in horse-drawn carriages. The dusty road wound up into the hills, crossing the River Claro, which lived up to its name by flowing down the mountainside as a crystal-clear stream, murmuring over boulders and rocks until it was lost in the distance. The penetrating scent of the myrrh trees pervaded the whole valley in springtime. In his heart, he always carried the memory of the eternal snows on the mountaintops. They were the white blood of the giants and the condors, the everlasting fire of the heavens. A road bordered by farm cottages led to the estate houses. These were surrounded by a high wall, painted a colonial red. The huge gates were open to allow the carriage and its snorting horses to pass through. The mansion was over two centuries old and was a single-story, L-shaped building with doors which opened onto a gallery supported by hand-carved pillars. The entire main body of the mansion was painted the same red as the outside wall. At the back stretched an enchanted garden with fig trees, willows, and chestnuts, at the bottom of which was a tiny brook whose water flowed from the Andes and whose banks were covered with a shady tangle of brambles, roses, and hydrangeas. The domestic dogs and fowl used to drink there together with the wild birds. Nearby were the kitchens, smelling of meat, roast chestnuts, and fruit dried or ripe, according to the season. Inside the rooms was an unforgettable aroma of old wood, of antique furniture made from jacaranda, mahogany, and oak, a scent of accumulated years and time. Attached to one end of the house was the colonial-style chapel with an altar carved by artisans from Cusco with gildings and a pair of strange candelabra made of myrtle wood with double-headed eagles whose bodies were shaped like hearts. This chapel contained the tomb of a 17th century Spaniard, a former master of these lands, and the sweet scent of lighted candles and evening prayers. But the child's paradise lay in a tiny circular garden in front of the house, surrounded by bamboo canes up which climbed roses, forget-me-nots, jasmine, and convolvulus. In the middle grew a huge pine tree which he now confuses with an oak in the central world, the land of Avalon. In his memory, it was a shady place, smelling of damp violets. On summer mornings, he used to go into the garden and not leave it again until midday. And during that time, where was the child? Mingling with the plants and the flowers, climbing up the huge tree until he reached its topmost branches, urged on by an intense desire to get closer to the condors who glided in the clear skies and who would stop in mid-flight in order to look at him. The child conversed with the flowers, with the grass that grew so sweetly and was so fragile, with the birds, and, above all, with the tree. Now he seems to remember that some tremulous secret revealed to him by the grass made him cry on more than one occasion. The child suffered for all these defenseless creatures who came and told him little things, their sorrows mostly, and asked him not to forget them but to take them with him when he was separated from them and could no longer understand their language. Don't forget us, they begged him. Take us with you forever. We want to make ourselves invisible within you. The Face One day, a face emerged from a rose. Its eyes looked at him as if he was not a child, but a timeless being. The face said something to him that he didn't fully understand, because he only spoke the language of the plants well. Even today, he has difficulty in remembering it. It seemed to say to him, 
seek me, love me. He lived that moment as if outside time. Someone came and took him out of the garden, forever, and never afterwards was he able to speak freely with the animals and flowers. He lost that faculty. But from that moment on, from earliest childhood, he lived only for love and to seek the face of that flower in all women. In their bodies, in their souls, he sought the scent of the garden of childhood, the secret of that glance, the illusion of that love. There, far away, in the garden of childhood, he had been given his diapason, the key of his melody, even before he felt himself to be ego, or perhaps at that precise moment. The Violets of Childhood A cake with five or maybe four candles, he couldn't remember which, and warm, foaming milk fresh from the cowshed, were brought to him on a tray. The tray was bordered with a garland of violets covered with dewdrops. Oh, the scent of the violets of his childhood. Like so many things, the violets of today don't smell the same as they used to. The white-haired woman who came into his room carrying his present, like a priestess from the Valley of the Andes, said, Happy birthday. Now you're not a child anymore. The violets also told him so, because they didn't smell the same as when he was a child. His ego interposed itself between him and their scent, between him and his garden. And he realized that now he would have to create, invent some non-existent violets, a non-existent garden, to bring them back to life. The tree, the flowers, the plants begged him to do so from the other side of a wall of glass, which was growing less and less transparent. Ego. I am a very young child, but at the same time I feel myself to be a very old person, timeless, as if clothed in a dignity conferred on me by the passage of centuries. I am standing in one of the rooms in that mansion which is over two hundred years old, in the foothills of the Cordillera of the Andes, in the precarious and mystical country called Chile, where there is always a light which seems to come from other worlds, perhaps from the morning star. To my right stands a big wardrobe which gives off an aroma of old wood. Behind me is a brass bedstead. In front of me is a table. Beyond lie other rooms and a door which opens into a gallery with pillars and vaulted niches. People are moving around. It is a beautiful day full of summer sun and moving light. Everything smells and sounds as if it was newborn, solemn, because it has been recreated. For the first time, so I believe, I have a sense of my ego. And at that precise moment, I begin to think like a philosopher, but with a clarity and lucidity that no philosopher ever had because I am a child philosopher and my thoughts are experiences with a recently incarnate ego. That is, I am both a very old and a new sage who awakens and directs his sure gaze over the world and over himself. With deep wonderment, I observe, firstly, myself, my newly appeared ego, and I am surprised but without being surprised, to feel myself to be me, me myself, uniquely me. And the most important thought that comes into my mind at that time, which I believe that I am thinking for the first time, is the following. Is it possible that in the midst of all the people around me, all the beings moving about here, I am the only one to feel myself to be me, that is, this unique me, 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 and not another. And then, looking at the people walking along that gallery, I say to myself, do they also feel themselves to be me? It isn't possible that each of them also feels himself to be me, uniquely me, that is, him, them. 
And this experience, so clear, so recently emerged from the secret coffer of the universe, has affected my whole life from earliest childhood up to the present, returning from time to time. Whenever, whether I wish to or not, I open the secret arc of wisdom of my childhood. And I continue asking myself, supposing that the ego is an electrochemical phenomenon in the brain's biochemistry, part of the mechanics of growth of the body, a center which opens up at a given moment in a child's development, is it possible that immediately this center is open, that child can ask himself such fundamental questions, gaining such a clear experience of an ontological occurrence, so to speak. Furthermore, this ego, which suddenly appears, where was it before? And what was the ego before? Or who was it? And in my memory, who remembers or who engraved this recollection on my memory? I see myself at less than a year old before the appearance of that ego, this ego, leaning over the balcony of a house in the city, holding tightly in my tiny fist my grandfather's blue sapphire ring with his initials engraved in gold. The street below was full of vehicles and pedestrians, and when the woman came to bring me indoors, fearing that I would let the ring drop, I felt offended, because I knew that I would never have done so because that child was a legendary personage, older than my grandfather, a person filled with antiquity, but as yet without an ego. Uninhabited Blue More than half a century has passed. I never wanted to go back, or I couldn't. I traveled the whole world, obeying orders, impelled by longing, the pilgrim of the great longing, always in search of the city of Agarti and Avalon, or in reality, of the central face in the garden of my childhood, and also of the face in the flower. And it happened that one day I went back, filled with the fear that the thought of coming face to face with a dream, or the ghosts of an idealized world, produces in us. However, everything was exactly the same. The fields were still transparent, the mountain tops snow covered, the old walls still painted red, the road dusty, and the river Claro running over steep rocks. Almost all the same people were there. Only the violets didn't smell the same, and the walls were older, and the gilded sculptures in the chapel were damaged. The double-headed eagle had lost its talons, but still had its heart. The tombstone had become encrusted in the floor, and its inscription worn away by the passage of time. I wandered aimlessly, thinking I heard the ghostly voices of my ancestors. Scenes repeated themselves in the light. I entered the abandoned garden, which had lost its protective fence and had been invaded by weeds. There were no flowers, no birds, no faces I could see or hear, and I stood beside the huge pine tree without anyone seeing me there. I rested my forehead against its ancient bark and embraced it, saying, Speak to me as you used to. Tell me your sorrows and your joys. Tell me everything. Although I believe I can't understand you, you know that I do. I haven't changed. I will remain the same until the end of our eternity. Thus I spoke to the beloved tree of my childhood. Whenever I read the following poem, I remember the pilgrimage which, late in life, I made to the land of my birth. And now, remembering my former self, the places I have inhabited, and which still carry my sacred thoughts. I understand that the feeling, the plea with which all strange solitude surprises us, is nothing more than the evidence which remains of human sadness, or also the light of the one who breaks through his security, his consecutive atmosphere, in order to feel how, on returning, his whole being explodes within a great number and to know that he still exists 
that he still enriches and impoverishes steps on the earth. But who is there, absorbed, the same without direction, solitary as a mountain, saying the word then, so that no man can console the one who suffers thus? All that he seeks, those for whom he now weeps, all that he loves, has also gone far away, attaining itself. My Comrade In this turn of the wheel, I have dedicated myself to explaining a myth and a legend, embodying them in my life. I have gone through life singing a certain obsessive melody, whose key was given me in the land of my birth. I don't remember if it was here, or in another place which is even farther away, in a remote polar region. It seems to me that none of this is new, but that I have repeated it thousands of times. I was orphaned as a child and was brought up by a widow called Fresia or Frasia, my paternal grandmother. I grew up in the forests of this southern land like a pure madman, nothing more. Very soon, I rebelled against the great widow, entering upon this combat with no other weapons than the memory of the face in the flower in the garden of my childhood, without God, because I also lost him very early on. As I narrate this hermetic biography, which is not accessible to everyone, this legend, and as I sing my melody softly, I thought to describe, with difficulty, enveloped in the mists of passing years and turns of the wheel, my meeting with and loss of a companion of my youth, whom I believe I called Jason, although his name was really Hector. Together we lived solar times, in a midday which was a midnight, dreaming of and searching for the city of dawn. Jason died young. He wanted to remain pure and upright, so as to continue the search in a new turn of the wheel, in times which would be more propitious for him. He would continue his search through all the turns of the wheel, in those to come and those that came before. At his graveside, I sang the song of the comrade. If you doubt, I laugh joyfully. If you sleep, I keep watch for you. If you leave, I shall fight for both of us, because to each warrior the gods have given a comrade. And if I return to life, you will also return to life in me. And if you have a dog, I will look after it, and I will enter the city with it. Thus there will be a dog in the sky with us. The Great War of the Mahabharata Jason left this second earth shortly before the Great War of the Mahabharata began. I took part in this war, although I didn't know the reason for it. I think because I was impelled by the blood memory, and it was this war that led me to the master and to be initiated into an ancient circle, which rules both poles. It was the master who explained the significance of the great war to me and the reason why I had taken part in it, guided by the blood memory. The war had taken place many times in many turns of the wheel, and it would repeat itself endlessly without beginning or end. As before, it ended with the defeat of the followers of the god of the losers of the Kali Yuga. The guides who didn't die on the corpse-strewn battlefields had to embark once again on the long exodus towards the ices of the south of the world in search of the subterranean city and the doorway opening onto the Star of Origins. Because the Norns had spoken, and it was not night that fell upon the defeated, among whom I was numbered, but the hope of resurrection in the Oasis of Ice. If we face defeat with honor, then that defeat is good. Such an ending is a spiritual adventure which has been successful in a parallel world and time. Harsh is the judgment of the Norns, and the warrior must accept it with honor and a joyful heart. I came to the master in the middle of this war by a lucky occurrence filled with meaning. One night I lay paralyzed in my bed, 
having awoken without waking, while I thought I was asleep. A current which originated at the base of my invisible spine began to rise along the length of my body, causing different centers or wheels to vibrate. As it spread, an icy fire paralyzed the parts it touched. When it reached my throat, I knew that no cry for help would ever reach a human ear. When the raging fire neared my forehead, so as to try and touch the top of my head, something was gripped by an unutterable fear, something which believed that it was going to die, to disappear forever, and it struggled between what it believed to be nothingness and its only known existence, between fear of a black void and its earthly light, its only possible light. And what was involved in that desperate struggle, stirring up a fundamental, perhaps cosmic happening, was the ego, my ego, which had appeared for the first time in the garden, in which the golden apples of childhood grew. The Master and the Serpent I am standing before the Master, having been led into his presence by one of my companions in the Great War, who had also drawn his sword and fought against identical ghosts. I feel that I have stood here many times before, looking at his blue eyes, his virile hands grasping the sword. I hear him say, You have been bitten by the serpent. Her poison is already circulating through your blood, and if you don't find the antidote, you will die. But don't think that this has only just happened. Your first meeting with her was in the garden of your childhood. But at that time, you saw her outside you, as a face looking out of a flower. Now she is inside you, and the enemy you will be fighting in this great war will be your ego, which has come between her and the elect. The ancient continent of Hyperborea was submerged in the terrifying flood, and the new sun was superimposed above it, creating a thin crust which talks another language, which no longer speaks for the animals and the flowers, nor understands them. Nevertheless, in the depths below, Hyperborea still exists, beyond the yellow sun and the black sun, in the ray of green light. Go down to the depths of the ocean, raise Hyperborea, make the legendary continents of Mu and Gondwana, the land of the giants, reappear alongside the narrow coastline of your present homeland. When the lost continent rises, you will rediscover the face of the serpent, and you will return to life with her. This is the resurrection, and it is also our great war, which we fight with honor, out of duty, knowing that no one kills anyone else, because those you kill on the field of battle have already died in me. And the ego, which you are going to overcome, will return to life in a different form, united with the face of your flower, incorporated in the old soul, in that him-her who waits beside a spring, in the roots of the tree of your childhood. Don't be afraid, don't resist, go into combat with a light heart, risking the loss of your ego with honor. Accept its death. Only when the ego is dead can he live. It will be returned to you, immortal, reborn. And don't forget that the battlefield is your own body, because the sky is also shaped like a man's body. The Court of King Antarctus As best I could, I followed the Master's advice, because in those hazy regions, enveloped in the phantasmagorical mists of the mystery and legends of the Grail, nothing is exact or certain, nor can we make use of any conscious decision or rational will there. Although, perhaps, we may be able to decide on a course of action a little before we come face to face with events. But there is also the blood and its memory, our solar, Luciferian origins, which will bring us out of the battle as either victorious or defeated, defeated with honor, and the memory of our beloved, 
the face of our beloved in our heart of hearts, as Novalis says. The battlefield was ready. I lay down on the bed and waited for the signal which would start the conflict between the two armies. From far off, as if from the thick forests on the horizon, a soft melodious sound could be heard and the fiery chariots began to approach like disks of white light, like flaming icebergs. The same vibrations of icy fire, the same growing paralysis as the invasion mounted, taking one city after another, establishing its rule in each, causing these centers to revolve in unison, so as to make use of them according to a plan and a strategic rhythmic law. The ego fell back to the upper reaches in order to fight the decisive battle at the summit, where it had earlier thought itself to be victorious, keeping control there on the very brink of defeat. However, now I wanted to lose. No, I didn't want to. Something in the blood memory decided that for me, perhaps the master, the face, or the memory of my beloved. An alien wisdom which reminded me, you are a follower of the god of the losers, you belong on his army, you will win by losing. And I gave in, and handed over the summit. I stopped resisting. A whirlwind of fire enveloped my head, as if I was entering a disk of light, and an eternity of nothingness, of nobody, was produced. Afterwards came the awakening, something like the return to a pre-existing point, both earlier and later in time, and once again I found myself traveling inside the fire and the light of the disk urged on by a music which was my melody, but played in the highest possible key. We were traveling through a metal-like tube, a funnel which was rotating fast, a break in space, I thought, which would permit me to reach the other earth, a parallel world and time, where victory awaits those who know how to lose with honor here. And then I was on the other side. It was something like a room with glass walls. In the middle was a round table, made of stone, of blue-green ice. On it stood a cup filled with a golden liqueur. Strangely, I seemed to know that the table was my own skull, and that the cup was an eye open in the middle of it, like the central eye of the giants. Around the round table, like luminous disks or stars, as my body had by now also become, were seated twelve knights in shining armor, each with a lady in a red gown standing on his left. Evidently, they were waiting for me because there was an empty seat which bore the number thirteen. The king, who is called Antarkthor, said, This seat bears the number of your star, according to the Venusian calendar of Tiuhuanaku, which is far more perfect and accurate than the calendar of the sun of gold, because it is connected with the black sun and the ray of green light. Sit down, Huanaku. I obeyed, and fell into a huge abyss. The whole earth shook, that other earth. I had sat in the siege perilous. I fell further and further, and as I went deeper into the abyss, I heard King Arkthor, who was now called Ant Arkthor, because he had changed poles, say to me, I can reveal to you the names of seven of these knights. As the table is round, we can begin with any one of them. However, there is an order and a hierarchy. Five names are missing, as well as one of mine. The thirteenth is the Siege Perilous, because in order to sit there, you must fight a well-armed knight. Also, you must come with your lady, wearing the red gown of resurrection. Don't return here without her. When I found myself lying on the bed again, I saw, through the window of my room, the morning star rise over the sleeping Andes, like an eye filled with a watery light. And I knew that it would never cease to keep watch over me, because it was my guide on the road of return. 
the stone which fell from heaven. I went to see the master and tell him about my experience. How is it possible that all this, which was taking place somewhere outside me, could at the same time also be happening inside me, I asked. Ah, he exclaimed, there is no inside and outside. You are alive, but you are dead. You seem dead, but you are alive. There is no here and there, nor above and below. What is inside is outside. I have explained this to you so many times. True, it seems to me that I have had this meeting and this conversation with you here in the circle before, but have only just remembered it. A memory of something that I have already lived through, or will live through. Is this reincarnation? What is commonly called reincarnation is an error reached through the thoughts and language of this continent which is superimposed on the one which we were speaking about earlier. An error of this new earth and new sun, which appeared within time, when the garden of childhood sank along with Hyperborea and Thule, where time was different and traveled towards the past, or just didn't exist. Our order knows and uses the language of the lost continent. It is a language of sacred signs, the vibratory sounds of the Orphic music. There is no reincarnation, only a repetition of the same thing, a return of the same thing, the playing of the same note in different intensities of the same tone. I've explained this to you too many times, but not yesterday, not tomorrow, today. So that because it is always happening, it's as if it never happened, or as if it is happening for the first time. Nevertheless, I remember it. I am remembering it as if it has already happened, or as if it were happening for an eternity. This is because you have reached midday, in the depths of midnight, beside the polar mountain of revelation, and you will be initiated into our order. You hear the sign of the warriors of our star, the star of Lucifer, of the great loser, the morning star, engraved on your forehead and your arm. I listen to what the master tells me extremely carefully. These are his orders which I will obey through all eternity. Yes, what is inside is outside. Here everything is outside, and you must go towards it as if you were interiorizing it. What else do you desire, O world, but to make yourself invisible within us? Outside there is a castle, a round table of King Arkthur, a grail, a hidden subterranean city, a hollow earth, your beloved who awaits you, and a disk of light which will carry you to other constellations. There is a holy war to be fought. The warriors of our order must first seek all this outside, but with the intimate knowledge that they are also seeking it inside. Better still, when they have found it outside, they will have also made it invisible to their heart of hearts, returning it to life there. And from then on, they will be able to move freely between these two worlds, and in many others, from inside to out, from life to death, without being either alive or dead, like a double-headed eagle which has a heart for its body. This is what has been mistakenly called astral journeying. It is not a journey. It is a falling from the flesh into the soul and they will return to clothe it with an immortal body, with the red gold of the alchemists to the grail, with the stone which fell from heaven. I am then a stone which fell from heaven, from a broken crown, an exile in this world, a pilgrim of longing, an acolyte of the god of the losers, a member of the circle of Lucifer, a warrior of the order of the morning star, a guardian of the dawn, a walker of the dawn. And the war, master? We are warriors from the most holy of wars, from a mythical, eternal, cosmic war, because there is a myth to be defended for which to fight and die inside and out. 
It was brought to this external earth with its slow vibrations, in the same way as the face in the flower in the garden of your childhood appeared to you, as if it had fallen from heaven or emerged from inside a great rose. And it really had fallen from heaven, from the rose of our star, with the stone from a crown which had been broken in a stellar war. It came down to this earth in the disks of light, along with the white gods. Purely terrestrial people do not believe in this myth of resurrection and eternal love. They did not fall from another planet, but are the slaves of Atlantis. Also, those who have come from opposing stars, from different universes, are fighting against our myth. Not all who inhabit the Earth are the same. This is why we are fighting, so as to preserve a myth, a legend, which flows through the blood memory. Defeat in the battles of this war will not be defeat if the myth is preserved in all its purity, because the archetype will rise like a phoenix from the blood-stained ashes, and the war will finally be won by a horseman riding on a white horse, which gallops towards the past, or who descends in a disk of green light. The legend of eternal love is on the point of disappearing because of the hybridization of the blood memories. The youth of today has been influenced by black music. The archetype has been debased. Plato showed us that Atlantis was drowned because of an indiscriminate mingling of archetypes, because of their destruction in the blood memory. The twilight of the gods has taken place. The sound of the horn can be heard echoing sadly in the forests of Hyperborea. After a long silence, during which he seemed to be contemplating some undefined point, as if someone standing there were telling him what to say, the master continued, The rebellious dross overflows from the forge where the alchemist is preparing the gold of resurrection. Counter-initiation, prince of darkness and slavery, takes advantage of this, only Zarathustra's Persian and Rama's Hindu are unconditionally on our side, despite having lost their war of the Mahabharata. They still defend their solar soul. Amongst us, in the south of the world, are the white gods, hiding in the city of the Caesars, in the secret refuges in the Andes, in the mysterious oasis of the South Pole. Your mission is to seek them. You will have to search the exterior world and try to enter its fortresses and gather together the scattered fragments of the broken crown, even if it means approaching that table at which an inexhaustible supply of food is served and the liquor of eternal life is drunk, so that, finally, you may sit in the siege perilous because you will have come accompanied by your beloved. Firstly, you must search your own country, your mystical homeland, which awaits transfiguration. You must go down to the borders of the Antarctic in search of the oasis of warm water, in the center of the ice field beneath the black sun of midnight, and discover the entrance to the interior earth where our great guide awaits you. You must love your native land as you once loved the garden and the flowers of your childhood. Because the warrior of our order does not scorn nature and its laws, but looks on it as an allegory of something supernatural. He is immersed in this allegory, although, at the same time, he is amazed by the eternal singularity of his ego, which is a-natural. Moreover, it is not enough for him to believe in immortality. He lives it. He is the man of great longing. The Initiation I had to wait many years before I was accepted by the guides who control us from the ray of green light, and the master decided to initiate me. I was summoned to the circular room of glass, which had been built in the south as a copy of the first home. The warriors were all there, dressed in black and carrying their swords. I, too, carried mine. The Great Sign of Return which revolves in the opposite direction to the turning of this present earth, 
was suspended from the vaulted roof. A fire burned in the center of the room. I drew my sword and passed it to the master. You must stand, he told me. No one kneels in our company. The others formed a circle around us. The master passed my sword over the flames. There are two swords. One day you will be the warrior of the two swords, when you regain the faculty of conversing with the animals and plants, which is the language of Avalon, spoken in the city of the Caesars. You will be the warrior of the two worlds, the inner and outer. There is only one sword, but it has two edges, like a double-headed eagle. It is the sword of the two consciousnesses of the awakening. The master drew a sign on the blade of the sword and handed it back to me. The warriors pointed their swords at my heart. Then they raised them towards the emblem of return. The circle is called Huil Kanota. You are now an Ankahuinka, a warrior serving the white gods of Albania. Now you can never turn back. Whosoever sets foot here can never go back. He must go ever onward, across burning deserts and icy plateaus, suffering thirst, half-frozen, alone, without human comfort, without the warm embrace of a living woman, until one day he reaches the diamond-encrusted walls of the City of Dawn, its drawbridge, its hidden entrance. By his constant courage in battle, by his fury alone, he will have gained the right to resurrection and eternal life. But whoever sets foot upon the path which leads to the great beyond may not go forward if he ever has the intention of turning back. He who has attained the human state and doesn't try to go beyond it is like a man who commits suicide. And the master gave me the first sign in our initiation. The sign is the language of Atlantis Hyperborea. When you trace it over your heart, it affects the two heads of the double-headed eagle and instantly reaches the two earths and all your bodies, reactivating them. It is your defense and paralysis. It is your defense and paralysis, those who are opposed to your myth, opposing Nas like a counter-initiation, an anti-spirit. Other signs will be given to you, either by me personally or by the guides, as they become necessary to the glory of your fight on the dangerous road which you will be following. May the Norns be propitious to you. May the Immortals give you their blessing. Go, seek, and never return. Leap. The Search Once Again Since that day, I have traveled the world from end to end, searching, consulting, looking deep into the eyes of every pilgrim I meet to see whether he is one of my comrades, to receive some sign or indication that would help me find the path that leads to the gates of the City of Dawn. At first, I allowed myself to be dragged along by the current that flows ever farther towards the south. I penetrated its borders, where Pedro Sarmiento de Gamboa tasted the bitter fruit of return, called Calafate. In the Sarmiento Mountains, by Lake Nahuel Huapi, I searched for the city of the Caesars, and one day I found myself at a great altitude near the peak of Melamoyu. Without knowing why, I burst into tears beside a small lake and a rock which stood on a plateau near a forest of petrified conifers. It was with great difficulty that I came down from there, as if half of my soul lay dead in that place. And I continued my search until I reached the icy wastes of the Antarctic, guided by a golden-haired dog always with the hope of seeing the oasis, which was the entrance to the interior world, the hollow earth, the refuge of our guides, appear in the thick mist, and in the expectation of their resurrection. 
I don't know what happened to my golden-haired dog, or whether I lost it in this turn of the wheel or another, whether it fell into a bottomless Antarctic abyss, or whether it was devoured by the ferocious skuas, those Antarctic seagulls which flew ever closer to its golden fleece. I have said that I traveled to all the ends of the earth, and thus it was. I crossed the great ocean which eats away at our coasts in the knowledge that the temples, palaces, and golden ghosts of Gondwana and Mu, the decomposing skeletons of the men of Lemuria, their treasures, their immense submerged powers, their cosmogonic dreams, still lie in its depths. And one day I reached the other spine of the earth, the Himalayas, because I thought to find the city of Agarti and the masters of my master there. I lived in India for many years, searching the holy mountains for the Siddha Ashram. The master had told me that its entrance was to be found on the sacred Mount Kailas in the Trans Himalayas, above the rain line, near Lake Manasarovar. I was on the point of reaching it, but I was prevented from doing so by the other races who had taken control of those regions and who were opposed to our myth forcing Kali Yuga towards its nadir, to the new kingdom of the ants, to a planet of lead. Only the judgment of the Norns can save our myth of resurrection and eternal love, and the sword called Blood Memory, and the disk of green light, and the return of the white gods. Carl Gustav Jung On my return to the West, in that European world which is not like the South American one, and which after the Thirty Years' War and the latest war of the Mahabharata has become like a body without a soul, I discovered that a noble white spirit had left Europe forever. I was told that the Grail had been taken by Parsifal to Albania, the ancient name for America, in a Templar's ship with a fiery cross on its sail, which revolved in the direction of return, towards the oasis of the South Pole. In Switzerland, beside a lake, in a tower built by his own hands, and whose construction had been determined by his dreams, I met the master of the Sphinx once more. He was carving a serpent on a rock, while the waters of the lake lapped gently round his feet. He saw me arrive, exhausted, thirsty, and hungry, and invited me inside the tower to rest beside the fire while he prepared a meal for me. He offered me wine in a metal jug, and we talked all that night and the following day. I shall try and reproduce what he told me. Like you, I have lost the war. When I left this life, a conspiracy will take place against me. It has always been so because only poets will be able to understand me and continue my work. Sometimes I think that my fellow countrymen, in this tiny land in which I am living in this turn of the wheel, hate me because I endanger their materialist, money-oriented way of life. I am not from this world. I am a Hyperborean. Like you, I am a stranger in this world, in this land inhabited by the slaves of Atlantis. We lost this stage of the War of the Mahabharata. Because of this, my work will remain unfinished, and only poets, as I have said, will be able to understand it and carry it on. This homeland of mine, which was once Druidic, has remained a part of a Celtic confederation whose symbol is a clover with four leaves because it lacks the fifth leaf, which is the Hyperborean polar spirit the leaf of the number of destiny. It lost it, or it never had it. At least your homeland is the land of the morning star. But you are to blame, I broke in. Why didn't you risk your all? You were also a son of your mountainous country, lacking in sacred fury. I would have lost the title that I had salvaged in that battle. And now it will be the sons of my own flesh who will take part in the destruction of my work. A creator, a warrior, should not have children. That is true, I agreed. 
He poured out the wine. He put some large pots and the old metal frying pan into the cupboard. He greeted them and thanked them, talking to them as if they could understand him. After an almost religious silence, he looked at me fixedly. Well, pilgrim, you have eaten and drunk. Do you wish to rest, or would you rather open your heart to me now, as you did long ago, when you were a king standing beside the Sphinx? I will talk to you, I replied. That is why I have come. Only you can answer me. Self I have been asking myself the same question for an entire eternity, without obtaining an answer. Is there any reason to believe that anything survives death? The ego, for example, can it die? If the ego dies, everything comes to an end with it. One day you explained to me that if the ego didn't exist, there would be no world. If a yogi, for example, had stripped himself of his ego in his profoundest state of samadhi, there would be no one there to know that he had been in samadhi, or perhaps he didn't know that he was in samadhi. Because there is individuality without ego consciousness, it exists even in a flower, a stone. A stone is a stone because it has no ego consciousness, said Meister Eckhart. Without consciousness, without ego, there can be no individualization. There is persona, but not personality. And the ego, this ego I feel myself to be, that only I am, how can it die? If it dies, the world comes to an end, because how can I know that it will go on without me when I die? Only because people tell me so, because someone assures me it is so, while I am still here. I learn that the world goes on after me, and it is I who hears it, always I. Ah, but if I really do die, then everything comes to an end, even the world, and I cannot escape from this. There is no possible way out for my ego. I can only think and feel the following. When I disappear, if ever I do disappear, someone in eternity will again feel himself to be me, exactly as I do now. And this I, who feels like this, will be I myself, just as if nothing had ceased to exist, because in the immense interval, after a whole eternity, if there is no I, this I, there is no consciousness, so that time also comes to an end. A moment a sigh, a nothing, the disappearance and resurrection of the world, the sleep, the repose of the gods, the eternal return. I have come here to consult you, to talk to you, to think with you. How can I know that you really exist, that you are also I, that you feel yourself to be an I, your I, only because I hear you tell me so? And it could well be a projection of myself, or a splitting of myself in two. Like all the rest, words that I am saying to myself, questions and answers that I am putting to myself. A monologue in front of a mirror, in which I am looking at myself. At the end of his dramatic life, Nietzsche also had discovered this. So they tell me, and he became all people in one, at one, and the same time succeeding in escaping from the circle into madness. But did he really escape? He passed his old hands across his forehead. This has been my obsessive melody, too. The anguish of this mental brick wall, this narrow path which seems to leave us without a way out, without an answer, because truly there is none. You know, there is none. The only thing I can confirm to you is that I, too, feel myself to be me. A poor answer. Because you don't believe me, you cannot possibly believe me. From your point of view, only you feel yourself to be me. This is how it is for you, even when I can assure you that it is the same for me, too. With your me, you will never be able to understand it. 
separate forever. There is no way out of this, no answer. That is to say, the answer is, there is no way out, no answer. The way does not lie in renunciation of the ego, crucifixion of the ego, but in its supreme affirmation, combining it with entelechy, with the persona which existed before the ego, and which felt itself to be so old, so ancient, so filled with dignity, combining them in the absolute personality. What is the ego? Where was it before it entered a child's body? I asked. He answered me with other questions. Perhaps it was the guardian angel, which the child later loses, when the ego enters his body. Or perhaps the guardian angel is that wise man who goes away when the ego enters the child's body and waits for your return. What is this you? Is there perhaps a third? Or is the ego a point, a fold in the mantle of the persona, of the monad, of which only a tiny part can enter a body made of dense matter? Have you ever considered the possibility that the technocrats of the science of Kali Yuga managed to give an ego to their electronic brains, their robots, merely by moving a lever? Mightn't something similar have happened in the case of the human being? Will the ego survive when the robot is destroyed? Will the same ego be reproduced in other machines? This horrifying possibility is for me a further proof that consciousness is an archetype which forges a path through the universe seeking to give itself a shape and that it uses the human being in the same way as it would use the machine. I have never managed to say this openly, that the ego is an archetype. I understand, I said. They are only words, I know. New receptacles for an old wine. Let us return to the point from which we have strayed, combining the ego and the persona. There lies the gate through which one can enter and leave Ultima Thule. I have called it individuazi. I have called it individuation. Combining the ego with the self, changing the accent of individuality, moving it from the rational consciousness closer to the ocean of the unconscious, without ceasing to be conscious, but with a different type of consciousness, bringing light as far as possible into the darkness, moving from the yellow sun of rational consciousness to the black sun of individuation. And the center that appears there, which is created, invented, to which the accent of individuality has now moved, is the self, a circle whose circumference is everywhere and whose center is nowhere, and which emits a ray of green light, the light of Gnosis, Meister Eckhart's tiny spark, which navigates in a ghost ship on and beneath the surface of the sea of the unconscious, with all its lights on. The fulfillment of the totality of a being, the unus mundus. This is individuation, giving a face to the self, to the guardian angel, the monad, making the creator conscious. And do you know where I found the concept of the self I used in order to allude to this mystery? In the greatest psychologist of all time, in Nietzsche, your wounded king, who was the first to discover it, using my German word selbst. What is the self? I asked. It is an island of glass lost in the middle of the ocean, a city hidden in the depths of a mountain an oasis of warm water in the midst of the ices. It is the continent of the Golden Age, a castle surrounded by flames, in which the beloved lies asleep. Yes, because once there was a king, a queen, a sleeping beauty in a wood, an eternal love. Only poets will be able to understand me. Anima Animus Eros was united with his beloved inside the great Orphic cosmic egg. Phanes, Erika Pajos. Eros unites, 
But Phobos, fear, hatred, nothing is closer to love than hatred, disunites, leads to separation, breaks the cosmic egg. So as to acquire consciousness, individuality, so as to be able one day to give a face to the cosmic egg. Complete fusion, losing oneself in one's opposite, in the loved one, is an effort to return to the original androgynous, is not a good thing. It goes against individuation, the immortality of the persona and resurrection, which is differentiation, the individuation of both partners, so that he and she can come together again separated, but in another way, united forever, resurrected. If you have the great good fortune to meet your beloved again, the her of him, in one of the turns of your wheel, don't make the mistake of marrying her. You would both be destroyed. What you must do is help her to die outside you. Love her as if you were committing a crime. The beloved must die in order to return to life as an immortal, placing her eternity in your hands. This is the true her, who leads the warrior to heaven, who is not an illusion, who does not drag him down to hell, profaning him, castrating his magic virility, turning man into woman. She is not the devouring mother, the widow who is not the widow, because she does not resign herself to her widowhood, and so castrates her son. Parsifal and Alexander had to employ Phobos, hatred, in order to escape from the great mother, the little widow, so as to achieve the grail, the stone of change, which the Greeks called Xoanon, totality. Das iwik we blished zit uns hinan, as Goth said. The eternal feminine leads us to heaven, because the impulse which drives you to fulfill the ultimate mystery, which I have called individuation, projecting the ego into the persona, into the monad, into the self, giving a face to the gods, lighting the darkness of the creator, is none other than love. Only love can make you cross the deep chasm, the drawbridge that separates your ego from the castle in which your beloved lies asleep, jumping into the abyss. It is in effect a change, a miracle. It is a non-existent flower, the self. Fall into this flower and you will find the face of your beloved there. This love, this impulse, is an icy red-green fire which consumes everything and projects you to heaven, loving beyond life and death for all eternity. This love makes you immortal. This face, this fire of love, which the Trabadours and Minasanger called Wover Salde, Isold, I have called Anima in the man and Animus in the woman. A more. It has been said that the man who loves God needs seven incarnations in order to enter Nirvana and liberate himself, and that the man who hates him needs only three. It is without God, but with his own fury, that Parsifal achieved the Grail, and his individuation, his self, his totality. This is the difference between the liquid road and the dry road. We do not know whether, as well as his fury, his phobus, his fear of the mother, Parsifal carried with him a memory of a beloved, as he was supposed to have advised his friend Gawain to do. Parsifal, with his fury or his hatred, was resisting a participation mystique, Samadhi, fusion with Adi, the primordial being, doesn't await him at the end of his road, because this would be the way of sainthood. What awaits him is Kaivalya, total separation, supreme individuation, absolute personality, the ultimate solitude of the Superman. This is the way of the magician, the Siddha, the tantric hero of the Grail, the cosmic isolation of the risen Purusha. The mystery of the Grail has preoccupied and moved me deeply since my youth. 
For this very reason, I did not wish to touch it, but passed it by on tiptoe, because I had a presentiment that this was something sacred that should not be psychologized. Unfortunately, I am not sure that others may not do so in my name after I have gone. I am surprised to hear you use the word psychologize. Having stopped in midstream, out of a desire to preserve the scientific nature of your school at all costs, having enveloped your profoundest experiences in the language that was in vogue at the time, so as to escape the accusation of mysticism and magic, you nevertheless find yourself laid open to the accusation of psychologizing tradition and sacred knowledge, such as alchemy, astrology, hermeticism, and even the I Ching. Having done so, you have gained nothing, because your enemies will always accuse you of mystic ambiguities and of being a Gnostic follower of Meister Eckhart. I know, this is why I have said that only poets will understand me, because somehow I have handed over the cipher. I too, like the troubadours of Occitania and the Minasangar, have sung in code, in cipher. For example, haven't I said that archetypes are psychoid? That is to say that, transcending the human psyche, they are beyond or before it. What difference, then, from the gods of Greece and India and of the ancient Germans, and my two or more collective unconsciousnesses incompatible between themselves? Isn't this the blood memory, the minne of the German troubadours, who sang of the memory of a love lost at the beginning of time? What difference between this and the race spirit of which the occultists speak? Without doubt, I could have gone much further had I, too, not lost the war. I could have linked my concept of the collective unconsciousnesses with the mysterious Tibetan doctrine of the Tulka and the Hindu-Buddhist doctrine of the Bodhisattva. A Tulka never says I, but we, when referring to himself. He is a race spirit embodied in an entire people. He possesses all his I, while also being conscious in various parallel planes or times of existence. He is ubiquitous. Thus, we link up with the theme of I, which you raised, and with Nietzsche's conclusion, which is no longer one, but all. Hinduism's samsara is also my collective unconscious, the river of samsara, of those archetypal forms. Maya, for the Hindus, illusion. And in the midst of all this is the self, like an ideal center, situated in no particular place in the immense ocean, like a non-existent flower. In the West, there was once a way of individual initiation into love, the mystery of the grail, of its esoteric order of knights, and the hermeticism of the German and Provençal troubadours, and of the Fidele de Amor, in northern Italy. The Trabadours' esotericism became a sort of Platonism, or an alchemical tantrism of the left hand. It possessed a ritual and an initiation by degrees, which went from the choice of the initiate by the glance of the lady of the castle, Beatrice, in the case of Dante, to the giving of a protective ring, a girdle, a handkerchief, or a glove. The initiate has been accepted. He is the tantric sadhaka. He then passes into the degrees of fenhedor, suitor, precador, implorer, boundman, and drut, he who has exchanged hearts, the betrothed. Rebus, the androgynous of the alchemists, he who has surmounted the ultimate test of Asag, uniting with his lady only in the mind, or rather, in the Maithuna, the mystical tantric coitus, the Mysterium Conjunctionis. From there, he should achieve resurrection, the state of definite separation, individuation in the absolute personality, Purushik, Kaivalik, of which we have already spoken. 
with the face of the beloved in his soul. In alchemy, the equivalent states are Nigredo Albedo, from which come the name Albania, and Rubedo, resurrection in the red immortal energy matter of Vajra. The Soror Mystica, the woman who is always at the side of the alchemist, is the Amasia Uxor, the magic bride of the Trabadour's love esotericism, and she is the Yogini and Parastri, the initiated bride of Tantrism. This miraculous Hyperborean initiation comes from a great distance from the original polar continent, where the female magicians, the priestesses of magic love, Morgana and Aluin, appeared, and also the women who, in the legend of the Grail, healed the wounded warrior and the sick king. This mystery comes to us from an unfathomable distance. In the West, it was destroyed with the Cathars and the Templars, with the Minasanger and the Fedele de Amor, with the Trabadours of the Languedoc, in the eternal war with the enemies of the divine myth. What had been a private, unique, aristocratic initiation had become vulgarized in the exotericism of the Church of Rome, which has taken possession of its symbols and adulterated them. The Gnostic lady, Sophia, Wolversalde, the feminine Holy Spirit, Pericletos, the dove, has been popularized as the Virgin Mary, the exchange of hearts, which is in reality the awakening of the Anahata Chakra, has been externalized in the cult of the heart of Jesus. The crown of thorns and the rosary have replaced the Templar's alchemical rose of a thousand petals, the Sahasrara Chakra, at the summit of the invisible skull. It is the assassination of the sacred way of Kundalini, of the tantric road of the chakras. A hermetic initiation of solar love has been adulterated by an exoteric lunar religion, by an anthropomorphic, exclusively materialistic cult. The initiation of loveless love has been destroyed, and man has gone over to the diffusion of a physical, matriarchal love, centered purely on the physical body of the woman, in which the externalized Eve triumphs, desecrating the warrior, imposing her female urgency, and her Demetrian fever for procreation. Love has become human, all too human. The loveless love of the warrior, of the troubadour, is the mystery of the grail. The love of the unresurrected woman and man in the Church of Rome, lunar Christianity, the initiatory poem, has deteriorated into the novel, the popular literature, and the unhealthy sexualism of our day. When we talk about the religion of love of the troubadours, of the initiated knights of the grail, of the true Rosicrucians, we must try to discover what lies behind their language. In those days, love did not mean the same thing as it does in our day. The word amor was a cipher, it was a code word. Amor spelt backwards is Roma. That is, the word indicated in the way in which it was written, the opposite to Roma, to all that Rome represented. Also, amor broke down into a and more, meaning without death. That is, to become immortal, eternal, thanks to the way of initiation of a more. A way of initiation totally opposed to the way of Rome, an esoteric solar Christianity, the Gnostic Christianity of Meister Eckhart, and mine, because I have tried to teach Western man to resurrect Christos in his soul, because Christos is the self for Western man. This is why Roma destroyed Amor, the Cathars, the Templars, the Lords of the Grail, the Minasanger, everything which may have originated in the Hyperborean blood memory, and which may have had a polar solar origin. 
the loved talked and written about so much in novels, poetry, and magazines, the love of one's neighbor, the universal love of the churches, love of humanity, has nothing whatsoever to do with loveless love, a more without death, which is a harsh discipline, as cold as ice, as cutting as a sword, and which aspires to overcome the human condition in order to reach the kingdom of the immortals, Ultima Thule. Synchronicity The earth is alive, and it feels with you. It follows your footsteps, your search, with equal anxiety, because it will be transfigured in your triumph. The end of Kali Yuga and the entry into a new golden age depend on the results of your war. The earth by itself cannot finish the work that nature leaves incomplete. Today the earth has joined forces with man in his destructive passion. The great catastrophe will occur in the first years of the age of Aquarius. But if you can find the entrance to the invisible double of this earth, fulfilling the mystery of loveless Amor, the volcanoes will become calm, the earthquake will cease, and the catastrophe will be avoided. There is an essential synchronicity between the soul and the landscape. What you achieve in yourself will have repercussions in even the remotest corner of the universe, like the ringing of a bell which announces a triumph or a defeat, producing irreversible effects in a secret center where destiny acts. The archetype is invisible, and if you once confront it in an essential manner, the effects are universal and valid for all eternity. The old Chinese saying expresses it well. If a man, sitting in his own room, thinks the right thoughts, he will be heard thousands of leagues away. And the alchemical saying, too, it doesn't matter how alone you are. If you do true work, unknown friends will come to your aid. What I have called synchronicity, Nietzsche called lucky occurrences filled with meaning. It becomes a poetic dialogue, a concerto for two violins, between the man-magician and nature. The world presents you with a lucky occurrence filled with meaning. It hands you a subtle, almost secret message, something which happens without apparent reason, a causal, but which you feel is full of meaning. This being exactly what the world is looking for, that you should extract the meaning from it, which you alone are capable of seeing, because it synchronizes, it fully coincides with your immediate state of mind, with an event in your life, so that it is able to transform itself, with your assistance, into legend and destiny. A lucky occurrence which transformed itself into destiny. And once you have achieved this, everything will appear to become the same as before, as if nothing had happened. Nevertheless, everything has changed fundamentally and for all time, although the only ones to know it will be you and the Earth, which is now your Earth, your world, since it has given itself up to you so that you can make it fruitful. Earth has made itself invisible inside you, as Rilke would say. It has become an individualized universe inside you. And although perhaps nothing may have changed, it might seem as if it were so, it might seem as if it were so, to use your own words. And you will be a creative god of the world, because you have conceived a non-existent flower. You have given a meaning to your flower. The Art of the Fugue as I was leaving, I said to myself, the rose on the cross is the symbol of the self, of the totality. It is the face of the soul, the transfiguration of the terrestrial, the flowering. The horizontal line of the cross is the feminine. She, the vertical, is the masculine. He, the rose unites them, joins them together. It is him, her, and her, him. The androgynous. But if the cross revolves dizzily, 
in a left-hand direction, towards the beginnings, back to Hyperborea, to the morning star, it turns into a flaming circle, which extends behind all the suns as far as the ray of green light, surmounting for all time, him and her, making them into an immortal oneself. They have been resurrected in the red energy of Vajra, centering on the immobile, polar movement. Immobile within movement, united in separation, loving each other with loveless amour. And when the cross revolves in this way, taking this direction, the face of the beloved emerges from the depths of the great rose. In the dawn, covered in alpine mist, while I walked through narrow passes, I had a vision, a dream. I saw myself inside an old Gothic church. With me was a woman who was explaining to me that the purest Gothic was to be found in Germany even though the style had originated in the north of France. The two towers had been transformed into one, and the whole line of the building seemed to defy earthly gravity and to strain towards the infinite in supreme flight. And she repeated to me, in German, Das ewig, we blich, sieht uns hinan. We listened to the last Bradenburg concerto by Bach, the most magical, holding hands and looking at a window which depicted an alchemical rose, through which shone the evening sun, transforming it into an explosion of pearls, droplets, cascades of green light. Then we kissed, bathed in that alchemical light, and it was as if we were kissing each droplet of light from the flower, the face of the flower, which was to me her face and to her his face. The Bradenburg Concerto had turned into the art of the fugue, the last and greatest creation of Bach's soul, composed on the highest peaks of his world, repeating a theme ad infinitum, although scarcely altering its meaning creating new laws in the movement of forces, but without creating new forces, within the eternal return of the same force, discovering in it lucky occurrences filled with meaning, which, when interpreted, transfigured, brought the possibility of ordering and determining human beings in a new, although illusory, way. A lucky occurrence which turns into destiny a non-existent flower, but more real than all the flowers in the gardens of this world. Hermann Hesse, the alpine mist dispersed. One midday, I found myself once again outside the door of a house where someone had hung a sign which carried the following inscription. When a man has reached old age and has fulfilled his mission, he has a right to confront the idea of death in peace. It isn't good to visit this man or to talk to him. One must give a wide berth to the door of his house, as if no one lived there. Once again, I met the master, who had not lost the faculty of conversing with the animals and plants, or who had recaptured this condition of youth in his old age. He was in the garden, burning leaves and branches. How much time had passed since our earlier meeting in the turning of the great wheel. He saw me appear and approached me with a luminous smile, greeting me with his clear eyes. We couldn't leave yesterday for the upper Engadine because of an unforeseen occurrence. My wife was stung by a bee. We sat down on a bench in the shady garden in the shadow of the chestnut trees. There were magnolias and palm trees and a huge fig tree, the like of which I have only seen in India. An enchanted fountain murmured melodiously. This is Klingsor's garden. I baptized it by this name in memory of the magician in Parsifal. It reminds me of the Villa Ruffoli in Ravello, which inspired Wagner to write the first act of Parsifal. When he saw it, he exclaimed, 
This is Klingsor's enchanted garden. Here, in this Casa Kamuzi, when a cycle has ended for you, I will give you refuge. In this house, you will discover the secret of the resurrection. From here, you will set out to attain it. I have been in Bolingen with the master of the Sphinx. He is a mountain, like San Salvatore, which we can see from here, like Monte Generoso, like the Matterhorn. I owe him much. My magic work begins with him. Damien is the self. His mother, Eve, is the great widow, the mother of Parsifal. We ourselves are the sons of the widow, the Minasangar, the sons of Wovra Salde, who sing of the deep longing for the Hyperborean north. We are Cain and Lucifer. I seek the Princess Fatima, you the Princess Pepin. Thanks to the master of the Sphinx, I met Abraxas. My work is enveloped in his secret gnosis. In reality, I am the poet he is seeking the poet who, without interpreting symbols, expresses them. In Steppenwolf, Hermine is the feminine of Hermin, my anima, as he would say. Like Aminasangar, I have sung in code. In some Spanish translations of that work, the cipher has been lost, I interrupted, because the name Armanda has been substituted for Hermine. It's the age we live in, he replied. No mystery, no secrecy, no gnosis. However, there is something that separates me from the master of the Sphinx. Music. I live. I envelop myself in it. Bach, Mozart, as much or more than him, have influenced my work. Mozart is present in Steppenwolf. The magic flute already reveals the mystery of him, her, and her, him, by leading us to Pamino and Pamina, Papagino and Papagina, by the dancing rhythm of its notes, him and her, with capital letters, and him and her, with small ones. Our master of the Sphinx doesn't live music with his blood. This is what distinguishes a Swiss from a German. I belong to that insensate, tenuous current of men of the great longing, which flows like a river of gold from the ices of the far north, from the Minne, and which reaches ecstasy with Holderlin, Kleist, Novalis, and Nietzsche. We are those who believed that we could change the world by magic idealism. You are one of us, because only in us will you find your kin. When I have gone, a conspiracy in which the sons of the flesh will take part will adulterate me, trying to link me with Negro music, drugs, and sexualism. They will turn me into a comic strip prophet and may even reserve me a place of honor in the Valhalla of Disneyland. But I will survive all that because I'm a Minasangar who has sung in code and because I also carry the sword of Goldmund named Mine, Blood Memory. And death, and your grave there in Gentiline? Death is like falling into the master of the Sphinx's collective unconscious, into the Samsara, in order to return from there to the circle, on a new day, to forms, to pure form. Why does death preoccupy you so much? Listen to nature, live its cycles, there, you can hear the voice of God, of the gods. I know that a great difference exists between my melody and that of the master who knows the language of the animals and the flowers. Perhaps he is too German for me in his feeling of pantheistic fusion with nature, which I cannot help feeling is sometimes a little morbid while nevertheless loving it so much. I hope, therefore, to be able to transfigure it one day with my magic idealism, synchronistically with my resurrection, driving away our mutual Kali Yuga, our darkest age. Novalis himself, so beloved by him, stated, God must be separated from nature. God has nothing to do with nature. 
He is the goal of nature, something with which nature will one day need to harmonize. That is to say, allegory, symbol, an involution exists, a golden age was lost. Better still, there exists neither involution nor evolution, only a change of state, which becomes visible and conscious in the smallest time space, only in the human era, because it is essentially an ontological, a temporal event. Nature, reality, which is only perceived in part, never in its own truth. The false is the essence of the real, said the wounded king, is the magico-cosmic precipitation of an idea, of a state which is in another reality, which engenders another reality and another. Terrestrial matter is therefore on the border of identification, being both experience and symbol. William Blake wrote, Nature teaches nothing about spiritual life, only about natural life. The devil is the mind of natural structure. Initiation does not admit that the human condition is an immutable destiny. It does not admit to being only a man. As we have said with Meister Eckhart, a stone is also God, but it doesn't know it. And precisely because it doesn't know it, it is a stone. The idea of death obsesses me, along with the inescapable reality of the sentiment of my ego. And even if this might originate in the depths of the ancestral soul of Spain, I know that it connects me essentially with the silent drama of the master of the Sphinx, with what he said, and even more, with what he didn't say. And the difference between these two masters is the difference that might exist between the saint and the magician, between the fusion, the losing of oneself in samadhi, and the separation in the absolute personality, in kaivalya, between reincarnation and resurrection. As if interpreting my thoughts, he told me, don't forget that, to the end, I remain both Narcissus and Goldmund, Siddhartha and Govinda, with my soul divided by opposing tendencies, the desire for surrender, fusion, losing myself, and also the search, longing, rebellion. As I left, he clasped my hand. The Wounded Warrior The Master had also said to me, Seek the comrades who were scattered by the Great War. On an old battlefield, I found the greatest of these comrades, a descendant of the Tuatha de Danann. He was badly wounded, lying on the banks of a canal. A heroic woman was tending him, staunching the blood which flowed from his wounds. Because of the tortures to which his enemies had subjected him, the warrior was almost dumb. He would soon be leaving this world. I sat down at his side and talked to him, telling him about my pilgrimage to the land of Occitania, in the Cathar Languedoc, my climb to the ruins of the solar temple of Mansugur and the Sierra Maladetta, where our brother, the warrior troubadour Bertrand de Born, let himself freeze to death. I recited his poem, The Praise of War, which the warrior had translated. The old warrior remained silent, motionless, like a rock, like a tree, absent, hardly even listening to me. I had an inspiration, remembering the garden of my childhood and the angel which might possibly have entered me. I thought of what people say about the second childhood of the old. Is it not possible that this angel, which seemed to float on the outside of the body for a time during childhood, also emerges in old age, and again remains outside the body, even before death. And this angel, which when it entered the body became me, forming the personality, becomes only persona once more when it leaves the body again. But for the fact that it possesses the face, I said to myself, enabling it to immortalize itself, projecting an absolute personality, 
beyond time and space. So that at such an advanced age as that of this wounded warrior, his angel can only be inside his body for brief moments, and it must therefore be sought on the outside. So I stopped looking at his bodily eyes and addressed my words to something that might be found floating like an aura, a little way above his head. Intensely, although calmly, I spoke to him. Be joyful, warrior, for in another seven hundred years the laurel will flower again, and you will once more lose the war. His body trembled as if beneath a gentle blow from something that had entered it, something that was wandering in the light of that Venetian evening, beside the doves of St. Mark's Square, over the dome of the Cathedral of La Salute, or near the Colleone Horse. You are one of the few. Bless you for coming at last. I was waiting for you. Now I can go. Yes, now you can go, because now you know that the gods give to each warrior a comrade. While you sleep, I keep watch, and when you have gone, I will continue fighting for both of us, because you know that I know that you have sung in code in your cantos. Also, we have both scaled the ruins of the solar temple of Monsegur, and one day we will rebuild it in another land where the Golden Age returns, and when the god of the losers of the Kaliuga, our guide, has been avenged. Then the warrior arose, dressed in black, covered with bloody wounds, and together we intoned the song of our beloved Trabadour, Bertrand de Born, in the language into which he had translated it. In hot summer have I great rejoicing, when the tempests kill the earth's foul peace, and the lightnings from black heaven flash crimson, and the fierce thunders roar me their music, and the winds shriek through the clouds mad, opposing, and through all the riven skies God's swords clash, and I love to see the sun rise blood crimson, and I watch his spears through the dark clash, and it fills all my heart with rejoicing, and pries wide my mouth with fast music. When I see him so scorn and defy peace, his lone might gainst all darkness opposing, and let the music of the swords make them crimson. Then I sang in my language for him. I love the joyous time, which gives birth to leaves and flowers. I love to hear the happy sound of the birds whose songs re-echo through the grove, and I love to see tents and pavilions erected in the meadows, and I rejoice greatly when I see armed knights and horses in the field, and see castles lustily besieged, and I love to see when a knight is the first to invade it, on horseback, fearlessly, well armed, I love to see his valiant courage, and the horses galloped, riderless through the thicket. He came even closer. Do you know why I stay silent? So that nobody can make me say anything opposed to what I wrote and did. And because, in the end, we warriors are alone, and no one, except our comrade, understands us, and no one is with us except the ghosts of the dead heroes. When the fire of combat awoke in our hearts, it could never be put out again. The tiny spark guides us. If I were to go back, if because of my old age and the pain from my wounds, they were to induce me to recant, the spirit of adventure, which has never died, would leave the warrior forever, and nothing would then remain but an empty body. Magic would have deserted us. Be faithful to the old dreams, so that our world doesn't lose hope. I took a step backwards. The better to look at him in the dying light reflected in the waters of the canal. And looking fixedly now at his bodily eyes, I pronounced the greeting of the legendary Trabador. Hail, 